was listening to the radio on Monday, and um, they called Monday Blue Monday. I don't know if anybody had heard that or not, but uh, Monday was Blue Monday, and blue meaning not very happy, I suppose. Blue Monday is a, a, is a day in January when we realize that Christmas has come and gone, for one, and we realize that New Year's has come and gone, and probably our New Year's resolutions, they probably have come and gone as well. Blue Monday is the day when most people, if you haven't already given up on your New Year's resolution, Blue Monday is the day that you finally quit trying to do your New Year's resolutions. Last week I had preached on why we were created. I don't know if any of you remember that or not. I hope that some of you remember why you were created and here's why you were, we were created. We were created to glorify God. Simple as that. Colossians 1.16 says that God made us for his own being, for our, his own self. In other words, we were created to glorify God. That's why you're created. That's why I'm created. You're not here because of your job. You're not here because of you know, other relationships, although that's all good and fine. That's not why you're here. You are here. God created you. God made you and me to glorify him. Rick Warren said it a little bit differently, but he said it. What he said was in his Purpose Driven Life book, I think it was like the second sentence, and he, he started his whole book off with this kind of idea, it's not all about you. I'm sorry to have to tell you that if you don't already know that, but it's not all about you. It's all about glorifying God, and I want to build on that today. Now, if someone were to ask me, uh, what is the most famous parable that Jesus ever told? I would say the most famous one would probably be the prodigal son. You probably remember the story about the prodigal son. The son asked his father for his inheritance before his father was even dead, which was an insult, obviously, to the father. But anyway, the father gives the son his inheritance, and the son, he goes off, and the Bible says that uh, he went into a far country, and he blew all of the inheritance all just like that, gone. Well, you know, the thing about that was he got so poor that he was actually feeding slop to pigs. And when he was doing that, he came to his senses, realized that, you know what, I think I'm just going to go home. And the Bible says that his father was waiting for him. I have this visualization of this father waiting on the front porch in the evening, every day, evening before it's dark, and he's waiting and he's sitting there just hoping that he sees his son walking down the lane. And he's waiting for his son to come. Literature has called this the world's perfect short story, and certainly this has been told and retold all around the world because of its universal application. I think we can all uh, understand and all reason and realize that, you know, we probably at some point in time, maybe we have been prodigal sons. It's the most famous of the parables that Jesus ever told. Now, if you were to ask me what is the most tender parable, I would probably say the parable of the lost sheep. You may remember that one as well. The shepherd, he has like a ton of sheep. He's got all these sheep, but he notices that one is missing and one is gone. And the Bible says that he, he left all of the sheep that he had to go find this one sheep. And so he goes out and he looks, you know, high and low. He looks in the, you know, in the creek beds and he looks through the thickets and the thorns and the thistles and the woods until he finally finds this one sheep. And he brings him home rejoicing. If you were to ask me what is the most comforting story for the helpless, I would say that that would be Lazarus and the rich man. There was more than one Lazarus in the Bible. Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus, he sat outside the gate. This Lazarus was poor and, and unhealthy, so he's sitting outside the gate. He, he has tattered clothes because he can't work. They're torn and ragged. He, his body is racked with pain and disease. Dogs come to lick his sores, the Bible says. And the only food that he had, the only food that he ever had was it came from the garbage can of this rich man. Then he dies and he finds himself in Abraham's bosom. Now what that means is he rep that represents blessedness after death. He finds himself in Abraham's bosom and he saw an eternity free from pain and suffering. What a great way to live an eternity. And we learn that the suffering of this world is nothing compared with the life that we're going to live one day. But if you were to ask me what is the most practical parable, 
that Jesus ever told. What parable applies more to how we live our lives today and how God reacts and reacts and how we react to God? I would believe that would be the parable found in Matthew 25. You know the parable. I've spoken about it before. It's a long parable, so I'm going to kind of condense it for you. Basically, here's what it was. Jesus said that there was a master who was getting ready to go away. And as he was getting ready to go away on a long journey, he calls at least some of his servants in, and he sits them down, and he distributes his wealth amongst these servants. Then he leaves. Then he comes back. Then he wants, to give, he wants them to give an account of how they shared this wealth, an accounting of this wealth. You know, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? One day we're going to give an account of how we have shared God's wealth that he has given us. And so these, these guys, you know, if they, were, if they invested wisely, they were rewarded. If they, didn't, if they didn't invest properly, they were not rewarded. In fact, they were condemned. That's the parable. As I said, it's, a practical, it's very practical because it applies to our lives because, you know, it shows us how God treats us and how God reacts to us and how we oftentimes use his blessings or, or think about his blessings and treat his blessings. So first, the master entrusts his wealth to his servants. So scene one begins with the master calling in these servants and he sets them down and he says to them, I am going away and I am going to entrust my wealth to you. So he gives five talents to one guy and he gives two talents to another guy, and he gives one talent to another guy. Now, talents in the Bible means money or dollars. You know, it depends on the translation, but it all means the same, okay? He distributes his wealth among them, and then he said to them, while I am gone, I want you to be good stewards of this wealth. He is the master. They are the servants. He owns it all. They own none of it. They depend on him for everything. In fact, if, they, if he didn't give it to them, if he wasn't generous and kind to them, they wouldn't have anything. They wouldn't even be able to live. Now he calls them in, and he says to them, I've been watching you, and I believe that I have concluded that you are faithful servants. Now, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say how many servants he had. He may have had dozens and dozens of servants. I don't know. But what I do know is he selected these three. And he said to these three, I'm going away and I'm, I am entrusting you with my wealth. Take care of it. Take care of it, he says. That's the end of scene one. So I think we can, we can really instantly draw some parallels from this story. We're supposed to draw parallels from this story. First of all, we realize that the master in the story represents who? Who do you think the master represents? Clearly, it represents God. We know that it represents God. He is the one who has it all. He is the one who owns it all. And he gives life to us. And he gives air to us that we breathe. And he gives us our bodies so that we can, we can live and think and plan and make decisions. Number two, we are the servants. You and I, we are the servants. Every hour of every day, we are dependent upon the master's blessings. Without the master's blessings, we're, we don't have anything. We are servants, and God, he distributes his wealth among us. You're wealthy, I'm wealthy. If we live in the United States of America, we're all wealthy. He distributes his wealth among us. So what can we learn from the parable? Well, I think that we can learn that God is always looking for faithful servants. That's right. He is always looking for faithful servants. And when we are faithful, if we will be faithful, he's going to give us more talents. We also learn that God is constantly studying our lives. Absolutely. He is constantly looking at our lives and studying and evaluating where we are, looking for faithful servants. To me, you know, what is interesting about this story is that God did not give these servants the same amount of money. The same amount of gifts and talents. Did you notice that? He gave one five, he gave one two, he gave one one. And when I first read this story, until I really started to understand this story, when I first read that story, it's like, well, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, why did he give one guy, you know, they all sit down, three of them sit down, he gives one guy five, he gives one guy two, he gives one guy one. 
But here's what I have learned and come to realize. The master, he knows his servants. He knows what they can handle and he knows what they can deal with. And he said, in fact, in verse 15, as I've read it, according to his ability, he gives. So, one had more ability than the other had in certain, and, and, on, and goes on. I mean, here's the thing. If he had given only one talent to the five-talent person, can you imagine what a waste that would have been? This guy, this guy had much more potential to use the talents. Or... Maybe, you know, if he gave, you know, if he gave the one talent, it gave five talents to the one guy who has one, then that guy probably couldn't have handled the five talents. God knew, the master knew the abilities of the servants, and so he gave accordingly. Then he leaves. And, you know, when I think about that, that's really the way that he is with our lives as well. I mean, isn't that how he works in our lives as well? God gives, and then he leaves us alone. He doesn't make us do anything. He doesn't try to coerce us into using our skills and our abilities and our talents to, to do anything other than what we want to do with them. He doesn't look over our shoulders so much to say and, and, and try to say, you got to do this, you got to do that. He gives us a free will and a choice as to how to use the blessings that God has given us and or if we don't even want to use them. He doesn't look over our shoulders. He gives and then he leaves us alone. He leaves it in our hands for us to decide what we're going to do with the skills and the talents and the abilities that he's given us. Scene number two is he comes back. Here's what it says when he comes back. Start in verse 19, uh, 19 through 30. Let me find it. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents, so I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said... You entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, you knew that the har I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have at least received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he... He will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. I will admit, there are some passages in the Bible that I don't like to read. And that's one of those. That's one of those. But I also know that I have to preach all of God's word. You know, so that's why I'm preaching about this message today. You know, when he comes back, you know, when he, when he comes back, the, ta the five-talent person comes in and he said, Lord Master, you know, I heard what you said. You told me to take care of it. You told me to invest, so here's what I did. You gave me five talents. I invested it. I, it grew into ten, and here it is. And God said to that man, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with over a few things. I'll give you more. The two-talent man he came in and he said, Lord, Master, I had two. You gave me two talents, and because I have two talents, I invested them. As you said, I got two more talents by investing them. And God said to him, the Master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will give you more. And then the one talent man came in. He said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard master and that you reap what you do not sow. So I wrapped it up, I wrapped the talent up, and I buried the talent in my backyard. Here it is, he says. I've cleaned it all up. You know, I didn't scratch it. It's good. It's exactly the way that you gave to me. And what did the master have to say to this man? 
you wicked and lazy servant, and God calls him a worthless servant in verse 30. And he threw him out into the darkness. Tough parable to read, tough parable to preach, tough parable to say, you know what, which one am I? Which one am I? I know that it bothers me to read it, and I think the reason that it bothers me to read it, maybe it would bother you to read it too, I don't know, but I think the reason why is because, honestly, I think that we can all identify with the one servant, or the one talent servant, more than we can identify with the five talent servant. I'll bet that that's one talent servant, quite frankly, my guess is he was just an ordinary man like you and me. He was just an ordinary person. Now, admittedly, he did something that he shouldn't have done. He did, and he, and he disobeyed the master. No, he didn't steal it. No, he didn't embezzle it. But he didn't do what God told him to do, didn't do what the master told him to do with what he'd given him. He did nothing with the talent that the master gave him. And so for me, I have to ask the question, why? Why didn't he do, some, why didn't he do what God told him to do? What the master had to say, why didn't he do it? The master told him what to do, but he didn't do it. I believe that one of the reasons why is he felt inferior. You know, really, when, you, when, he sits, when the master sits you down and says, I'm going to give you five talents, I'm going to give you two talents, and oh, by the way, I'm going to give you one, I'm sure that he probably felt a bit inferior with, he, with rubbing, you know, rubbing shoulders with these other people. I think it's easy to identify with this one talent man, isn't it? You know, there wasn't really anything special about this one talent man probably like I said he was probably pretty ordinary he didn't stand out from the crowd he was probably pretty much average just kind of just about just like you and me just like you and me second Jesus tells us that he was afraid he was afraid because he believed the master to be a hard master he said in verse 7 in verse 25 you are a hard master but here's the thing what that tells me is this he did not understand the master at all. He simply didn't even seem to know the master or didn't even know what he was like. Yes, God does. Absolutely. God has expectations for all of us in here today. There's no question about that. But God is not hard. God is not hard. God is gentle and understanding and kind and forgiving and merciful. That's the God that I know. He misread the master. He didn't even know who the master was. This one talent man did not understand the master. That is why he was afraid. And that is why he buried his talent in the backyard. I want to ask you some hypothetical questions about this parable today. What if the five talent man had buried the five talents in his backyard? You ever think like that? I, I got thinking about it like that. Okay, this five talent man, he took his five talents and he buried them in the backyard. What do you think the master would say to him? He would say the exact same thing that he said to the other person who only had one talent and buried them. Wouldn't he? You know the answer. They would have taken away the, the talents that he had from him, and he would have received the same rebuke that the one talent man rebuked, had. What if the one talent man had invested his one talent? You know the answer to that as well. He would have also heard from the master. He would have heard exactly what he had to say to the others. Well done, good and faithful servant. So let me ask you another question. What if the one talent man had invested his talent and lost it? What if he had invested it and lost it? What do you think would have happened then? I think that this is a very important question because I think that this is how we view God. How we answer this question is how we view God. What if the one talent man had invested his talent and lost it? What would the master have done? What would God have done to him or with him? What's interesting to me is that that idea is never even suggested in our text. Never once does it say anything about, well, if he had invested it and lost it, then this is what's going to happen. You never heard that. In fact, nowhere can you find that question ever answered. Nowhere can you find that question ever answered. And why is that? Here's why. Because God never commands us to be successful, that's why. He never does. I have never found a place where God says, if you try and fail, I'm going to condemn you. Show me where that's at. If you try and fail, I'm going to condemn you. I'm telling you, it's not in there. God's word only commands that we be faithful. That's all it is, that we be faithful. If he gives you five talents, if he gives you two, if he gives you one, the command is just be faithful in what I've given you. 
that we be faithful in investing the talents and the skills and the abilities that we have. It's as simple as that. But if we bury them, then we're going to lose them too. Listen, we don't lose our talents by investing them. We don't lose our talents by investing them. We lose our talents by burying them, by not using them. When we invest our talents for him, God always honors our investments. You know, there are thousands of churches across this land, many of them Methodist churches, who at one time were five-talent churches, and I'm telling you, they're nothing but empty shells now. And why is that? Here's why. Because they buried their talents, that's why. They stopped preaching this word. They stopped te- praying for people. They stopped caring about people. They stopped doing what this book told them to do, and they lost their talents. It was taken away from them. You know churches like that, and so do I. Some are Methodists, some are whatever it is, but they're out there. There are thousands of Christians. Christians who, who quite frankly, they reached a level of maturity, and they, and, they, and they became satisfied. That's a really bad word in the Christian walk right there, satisfied. They decided that they didn't need to study God's word anymore. They didn't need to pray anymore. They had had it all. They're, they got it all right now. They got it, and they figured it out. They didn't do any of those things, and they started to die spiritually. Started to die spiritually because they buried their talents. The principles never change. All through Scripture, Jesus is challenging us to invest. What's he challenging us to invest? Our time, our talents, our resources, all of the gifts that he has given you and me, he wants us to invest it. He says, I just want you to, I want you to use yourself up. Remember why you're here. You are here to glorify God. If you have it any other way, if you think about it any other way, you got it wrong because I'm telling you, God one day is going to have us give an account for our lives and he's going to say, Here's what I gave you. I gave you this skill, that skill. I gave you these resources. I gave you these abilities. How did you use them? One day that's going to happen for you, and one day that's going to happen for me. We're going to be just like that master. He's going to, he's going to come and return, and he's going to say, what did you do for me? Did you use all of those skills, all those abilities, everything that I gave you just on yourself? Or did you use them for my kingdom? And you will be rewarded accordingly to what you did. It's as simple as that. This parable is really not about a master and servants. This parable is about you and me and how we choose to live our lives. It's as simple as that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word today and for its truth. The truth is this story is about us. It's not about other people. It's about us. And you have given us skills and talents and abilities, and you expect us to use them. And the question will become, how faithful have we been, and how faithful will we be? And we will give an account one day for that, and we will be uh, given rewards based upon that account. We thank you so much, Lord, for giving us uh, the knowledge of the fact that we will see you one day. And we will give an account for our lives. What will that account read? In your precious name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 530.